All right, so we reached a stage where we were talking about uh, the moment distributing uh, distribution, the moment generating function for a probability distribution, <coughs> and then I mentioned something about the cumulant. So let us uh, carry on with that. The idea is the following. If you have a probability distribution for some random variable, and from now on, let me use a symbol capital X for a random variable in general. It could be continuous, it could be discrete. We have looked at discrete random variables, integer valued ones, but we are going to extend it to continuous random variables as well. Then you define a moment generating function M of u. as equal to the expectation value of e to the u x, where this x is the random variable. And of course, that is immediately equal to a summation from uh, k equal to 0 to infinity u to the k expectation x to the k divided by k factorial and these are the moments of the random variable okay. could be discrete could be continuous whatever with respect to the average is taken with respect to the normalized probability distribution okay. now immediately it follows that m of 0 must of course be equal to 1 because we put uh, u equal to 0 here all terms vanish except the k equal to 0 contribution which is 1 the expectation of 1 is just 1 so that is the normalization of the probability and then one can ask can this quantity can m of u be written as e to the power k of u some k of u okay. can we do that what does that mean it says you are taking this quantity here which is in general going to be some power series in u as you can see and you are writing it as the exponential of another function out here and we will see the advantage of doing this very shortly. Of course, this immediately implies that uh, k of u k of u is the log of uh, natural log of uh, m of u here okay. and k of 0 must of course be 0. So that m of 0 is unity as we have seen here. Okay. So in general, summation from r equal to 1 to infinity, some constants some kappa of r u to the power r over r factorial and these constants u independent quantities this quantity here is the so called rth cumulant of the random variable okay. Now it is not hard to see that these cumulants are going to have interesting properties. Uh, kappa 1 equal to it is just the mean value of x that is trivial to do all you have to do is to expand this quantity and pick out the coefficient of u in the power series in u and then you discover immediately it is just the first moment that is trivially true. Okay. The second moment kappa 2 equal to turns out to be x minus the expectation value of x whole squared equal to the variance. It is just the variance of the random variable. As you know the second moment itself we found was a very inconvenient quantity to use. You needed to subtract the square of the mean from that and then you got a quantity which had a physical significance as a scatter of the variable about the mean and that is kappa 2 the second cumulant. Okay. Turns out that the third cumulant kappa 3 turns out also to be x minus x average cubed namely the third central moment 
turns out to be identically equal to that. Okay. Now, when you write this in a power series, put that in here and write this as a product of terms and then write the expansion of each of these and collect, compare with what happens here with the various moments, you discover immediately it follows from here that the highest term, the leading term in the rth moment is in fact the rth moment, uh, in the rth cumulant is the rth moment, but then things get subtracted after that. Now, for instance, this quantity here is just x squared minus x average squared. This quantity here would be an x cubed minus 3 times x squared x and then there would be a term which would be plus 3 times x times x average squared and then a minus x average cubed. But when you take the average value of that, you get a cube here, x average cubed with a 3 and there is a minus 1. So, the next term must of course be twice x cubed in this fashion. Okay. The fourth cumulant turns out to be x minus x average whole squared uh, to the power 4, but there is a correction to it which is thrice x minus x average squared, this follows the variance squared. And of course, if you expand this, this is equal to x 4 and then plus etcetera, there is a correct set of corrections, lower moments than the fourth are going to appear rest of it. So, there is a systematic way by which you can write the rth cumulant in terms of the rth moment and lower moments and vice versa, write these. And the coefficients are standard coefficients. In a sense, what is happening? You are kind of subtracting out the lower moments, an appropriate combination of lower moments when you do this. And you have seen this happen in many, many places. For instance, when you subtract out uh, in the quadrupole moment of a charge distribution, you, uh, you subtract out the lower moments in exactly the same so that the whole thing is uh, rotationally it is got interesting definite transformation properties. In exactly the same way by doing this subtraction a very important property emerges among other things namely if you just shift the random variable by a constant value then the moments of course would change but the cumulants do not change. So, if uh, x is replaced by y which is x plus a constant a, some constant value a, sure value a, then the first moment of course will change because the average of y is now the average of x plus a, this constant a, but all the cumulants remain exactly the same. Kr for x equal to kappa r for y for r greater than or equal to 2, that is trivial to see. It is immediate here for example you immediately see. Whenever you can write it in terms of central moments, this thing, the mean value just cancels out, the shift in the variable cancels out and then you have uh, this invariance here. So, the cumulants of a random variable are invariant under translations of this random variable. You shift it by a constant, then it does not change at all. That is one very crucial property. Let us write down the cumulants for various distributions that you already know about. So, we have seen a whole lot of distributions for which we know closed form answers. So, let us write it down. Uh, if you recall, just to recall to you what happened, if you recall I defined a generating function f of z, this was just a generating function and then I had a moment generating function m of u and we found that this was just f of e to the power u. So, wherever z appears, I just replace it by e to the power u and k of u, the cumulant generating function is just the log of m of u. Now, let us see what this turns out to be for various distributions so that you could write the cumulants down. For instance, the binomial distribution. the probability distribution itself 
we wrote down it is just the binomial the generating function for that was of the form uh, f of z was equal to p z plus q to the power n when you had n Bernoulli trials and p was the probability of success in any given trial then it says m of u is this fellow. So uh, remember that uh, the average value mu the mean was equal to n p. So instead of n let us write it as mu over p and if I take logs I put instead of z I put e to the power u and then I take logs I end up with uh, k of u equal to mu over p plus 1 minus p. So that is the cumulant generating function for uh, and remember that the kth cumulant rth cumulant k of of r is dr over d u r k of u evaluated at u to the z. So once you have this expression it is a very simple matter to write down what the cumulant generating function is and therefore what the cumulants are completely for this uh, dis binomial distribution. What happens in the case of the Poisson distribution? For the Poisson f of z was just e to the power mu times z minus 1. Okay. So I replace z by e to the u and then take the log to get kappa of u, uh, k of u. So this immediately says k of u equal to mu e to the u minus 1. That is it. What can we now say about all the moment, all the cumulants? All you got to do is this differentiate it set u equal to 0. If you differentiate this fellow you can just e to the u once again you put u equal to 0 you get 1 right. So it immediately says that uh, for this Poisson k r equal to mu for all r greater than equal to 1. So the mean the variance the higher cumulants they are all the same it is just one number it is a very special property of the Poisson distribution not shared by others there are other distributions which might dis display this property you can create them but the fact is that uh, for the Poisson the variance so the statement that the variance is equal to the mean for a Poisson distribution is a special case of a more general statement that all the higher cumulants are equal to the mean value in this case. What other distribution did we look at? We looked at the geometric distribution right. So for the geometric distribution with mean mu uh, the distribution itself was 1 over 1 plus mu so geometric times mu over <coughs> 1 plus mu to the power n that was the probability distribution of the random variable n which took values 0, 1, 2, 3 etc. And now if I find f of z for it it is just a summation of this guy so it is 1 over 1 plus mu and then this geometric series summed from 0 to infinity which is 1 over 1 minus this guy multiplied by a z. So the 1 plus mu will go away and you get 1 over 1 plus mu minus mu z but I got to put e to the power u here that is m of u. So it says k of u equal to minus log 1 plus mu minus mu e to the e and that is it. And now we can write down all the cumulants from this directly. A sum of Poisson random variables again Poisson so nothing new happens. What happens if you have a difference of the two? If you had a skellum distribution for instance.
where you have the difference of two Poisson random variables whose means are mu and nu say. What happens then? Well, the generating function was this and then in the other case for the nu because of the minus sign when we generated it you had an e to the 1 over z instead of z. So it would be just this plus nu times e to the minus nu uh, e to the minus u minus 1 that is k of u okay and of course the first cumulant is the first derivative of this at u equal to 0 and that will immediately give you mu minus nu which we know is the mean. The second cumulant you differentiate this twice you are going to get a plus sign again and so on. So it immediately it says kappa r equal to mu plus minus 1 to the power r mu in this case. So every other moment uh, every other cumulant is uh, mu plus nu and every other one the, the even ones are all mu plus nu and the odd ones are all mu minus nu as you as you would expect in this case. We will write down the cumulants of co some continuous distributions as we go. Mm. So the first important property of a cumulant is that it is translation invariant. Mm. The other property that is obvious by looking at it is that the cumulant is a homogeneous the cumulant uh, the rth cumulant is a homogeneous function of this random variable in a strange way that is if you multiply the random variable by a constant then the rth cumulant gets multiplied by that constant to the power r okay. and that is fairly straightforward to see. So if x goes to c times x kr is multiplied by c to the r. So the scaling property is also very immediately obvious here. The cumulant has another very crucial property. We saw that the variance of two independent random variables add is simply the sum of the individual variances. This is going to happen for all the cumulants. The additivity of cumulants is a very, very crucial property and we can see that in many, many ways. But one way of seeing it is to say that well if I take the log here this moment generating function just multiplies for various random variables and if I take the log it simply adds up. Here. So it is clear that if you have several random variables independent random variables then and they are independent statistically independent then the cumulant rth cumulant of the sum is equal to the sum of the cum rth cumulants. So the crucial property is the for independent this is absolutely crucial it is a very very important property we will make use of it as we will go when we talk about limit theorems we are going to make use of this at least part of this property. Okay. Now I have mentioned off and on continuous random variables so let us just say a few words about it and then uh, so you have a continuous let us call x the random variable takes values in some uh, continuous interval of the real axis for instance or takes values over all real values of uh, over, over all real numbers then uh, instead of talking about a probability of this x for any particular value which must be defined with infinite precision now it is a set of measure 0 a point in a continuum all you can talk about is the probability density function of this variable that this random variable has a value probability that x has a value in some x x plus dx equal to p of x dx p of x is the probability density function I will call that uh, denoted by pdf 
that is the probability density function and it cannot be negative this number cannot be negative could become unbounded all you need is normalization. So, all you need is integral d x p of x equal to 1 over whatever is the range of this variable in general uh, minus infinity to infinity say and you also need p of x to be greater than equal to 0. Now, we are going to be rather loose in our mathematics if for example, uh, you have a situation where there is one particular point in the continuum where there is a finite probability that this variable has a value then we will include it in here by putting a delta function at that point. We will put a delta function spike in the PDF with an appropriate weight factor so that it gives you the probability of taking on that particular value. So, we will be a little casual about this I will continue to write integrals, but then in here could be delta functions out here okay. Alright, now once you have a continuous random variable of this kind the con it is convenient to define and once you have a probability distribution function of this kind which is integrable it is convenient to define a Fourier transform for this variable and the Fourier transform of this quantity P tilde of k equal to integral minus infinity to infinity dx e to the minus i k x p of x this quantity this is called the characteristic function of this random variable. but it is nothing new we have already introduced this quantity in a different way this quantity is thus the expectation value of e to the minus i k x with respect to this weight factor here. But we know what e to the u x is that is m of u. So, this is nothing but m of minus i k. So, the characteristic function is just on the way of writing of saying that you have a moment generating function ok. There are analytic properties of these variables which I am not emphasizing at the moment, but you see if you give me an arbitrary function p tilde of k I cannot claim immediately that it is the characteristic function of a, prob a random variable till a certain set of conditions is satisfied. For instance, if I want a normalization to be valid for this if I put k equal to 0 here and I want the integral to be equal to normalized quantity 1 total probability then this immediately implies that p tilde of 0 must be equal to 1. But even more strongly given a function p tilde of k it can be a characteristic function only if it is Fourier transform only if it is inverse Fourier transform gives you a non negative function p of x. So, that is a very strong constraint a real function should be real and it should be non negative that is a very very strong condition. So, all functions of k are not going to be even if they are integrable are not going to be characteristic functions ok and that is an important test in what follows all right. Now, the additivity of cumulants follows trivially once I introduce the characteristic function as you can see from here because this immediately says that so if I have a random variable x1 and another random variable x2 with moment generating functions m1, m2 and cumulant generating functions k1, k2, etc., then it immediately says as you can see. Uh, the probability density function of the variable let us call this equal to x say then p of x is equal to an integral from minus infinity to infinity dx1 integral minus infinity to infinity dx2 p1 of x1 p2 of x2 
where x1, x2 are the points in the sample space of these two variable random variables and p1 and p2 are the corresponding probability density functions okay. Multiplied by the constraint that x1 plus x2 must be equal to x okay. And where does that get us? That says this quantity is minus infinity to infinity dx1 p1 of x1 p2 of x minus x1. If I use the delta function constraint then this is all it is. Now it, in what form is this quantity here? It is a convolution. So it immediately follows that p tilde of k equal to p1 tilde of k p2 tilde of k. By the convolution theorem for Fourier transforms. But that is the same as m of m1 of minus ik and m2 of minus ik and if I take logs this immediately implies that k of u, k of u or minus ik does not matter these are all power series so which implies that the cumulants add up. because the cumulant, the rth cumulant of this quantity is the coefficient of minus i k to the power r divided by r factorial or whatever, right. So it says immediately the additivity of cumulants is a trivial consequence of this fact here, okay. If they are discrete value random variables over some finite range or something like that, you got to work a little harder to do this but it is pretty much the same thing. Yeah. Uh, the x there should be an additive of both x1 and x2. Uh, what should I am sorry, say that again? The x1 plus x2 should be equal to x in that case. When we are finding the probability density function of x, yes. Like, what exactly are we doing in this? Uh, we, have, we have written x1, comma x2 equals x on top. x1 uh, plus x2 is uh, equal to x. On top. Point variable. Ah, I am sorry. I am very sorry. Thank you. Yeah, x1 plus x2 is yes. some. Yes. Yeah. Now, a generalization to some constant times x1 plus some other constant times x2, any linear transformation, similar things would happen, but you can check that out directly. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Now, we could go back and look at various uh, continuous distributions or even. Uh, the discrete distributions and ask for sums of random variables and that is it is going to become very important to understand how the sums of random variables behaves. When you have a large number of components we are going to spend some time on it but let us do this in the context of a very famous example. The simplest of these examples the most ubiquitous of, of continuous distributions is the Gaussian distribution. So let us write down the answer for the Gaussian distribution what happens to the cumulants and a very important property will emerge. So the Gaussian it is also called the normal distribution and it is parameterized by two quantities the mean and the variance. The PDF for the Gaussian so first of all you got a random variable x which is an element of minus infinity infinity and the corresponding PDF P of x the normalized PDF is this quantity. I should use curly x here the value then the mean value of x this quantity is mu and the variance of x equal to sigma square. So it is parameterized by the mean and the variance the two parameter distribution. Okay. Now this distribution is going to appear ubiquitously everywhere we will see when we look at uh, the central limit theorem how this distribution emerges in a very very general context. But right now 
let's look at some of its properties. First of all, the shape of this distribution is quite straightforward. It's something which is bell shaped here, where this is the mean value. It's unimodal, the peak is at the mean out here. There's a function of little x, this is p of x. And this width here, this half width, is proportional to sigma. So the full width at half maximum the value at this point at this mu at x equal to mu is 1 over root 2 pi sigma squared and when you go to half that value this quantity here the width is proportional to sigma and sigma is the standard deviation out here. Okay. You could ask what the cumulative distribution function is. So the cumulative distribution function uh, let us call it f of, well there are various notations used for it, let us call it p of uh, x. This is equal to the probability that the random variable x is less than or equal to some specified number x, hmm, which is equal to the integral from minus infinity up to x of uh, dx prime p of x prime. So the probability that the variable has a value less than some specified value is the area under this curve. That is the cumulative distribution function. It is clear it cannot be a decreasing function. It has got to be a non-decreasing function. In this case when you have a distribution like this as you move to the right the area keeps getting added to so it is an increasing function. right? And p of uh, minus infinity is 0, p of uh, infinity is of course 1. Let us use another symbol for this. I do not like this p. Let us call it f out here. f of infinity is 1. And by the symmetry of this distribution, it is uh, quite clear that f of mu equal to a half. At this point, you have exactly half. The area is exactly a half. Can we write down this f of x in terms of some known functions? Well, there is this famous integral, it is called the error function, error function of uh, x. This is defined as uh, an integral from 0 to x dt e to the minus t squared. And you want to normalize it. So 0 to infinity, the answer is equal to square root of pi over 2, so 2 over root pi. Then erf infinity is equal to 1, erf 0 is 0, and erf min minus infinity, it is an odd function, so it is equal to minus 1, goes from minus 1 to plus 1 to infinity, uh, to 1 at x equal to infinity. So this quantity, this f of x, it will turn out to be half 1 plus the error function of uh, x minus mu because I have shifted everything to mu, the origin to mu and it should be scaled down. I used a dimensionless variable here. So what I need is in the probability density I had e to the minus x minus mu whole squared divided by 2 sigma squared. So the length scale there was fixed by 2 sigma squared, right? So I got to kill that. And that's all it is. Okay. And this erf x itself is a, a function which looks like this: the function of x this is one, this is minus one, that's zero, and the function goes like this. And that's what the cumulative density distribution function of this uh, random variable is. Okay. Statisticians like to use the cumulative distribution function rather than the probability distribution function itself for various reasons. First of all, when you have these atomic probabilities, namely you have a given point where there is a finite measure, 
for instance. Then we need to introduce things like delta functions and so on which are rather singular objects. But when you integrate it out things get smooth. So people like to use this rather than using, you do not mind using step functions but you delta functions are little singular, you got to define them more precisely etc. So it is convenient in many cases to do this, physicists generally work with densities all the time, probability density functions etc. So once we have this we could ask what is, uh, what are the various quantities uh, associated with uh, this Gaussian distribution, two parameters mu and sigma squared the variance, we could ask what all its cumulants are for instance, we could ask what its moments are and what would be the moments of this distribution, we already can predict what is going to happen. For a Gaussian uh, we can ask what is x minus the average value, the central moment, this quantity, this is of course 0 by definition because mu is just expectation of x. But we can ask what this is for the kth moment 2k plus 1 say, the odd moment, what should this be? Well the PDF is a symmetric function of x minus mu and now I am asking what is the average value of x minus mu to the power an odd number an odd integer it should be 0 by symmetry this is 0. The integral exists for all positive k as you can see because there is a e to the minus x squared to take care of convergence definitely all the moments exist. So this is identically equal to 0 etc. Uh, 0 2 maybe it does not matter. And what are the even moments like? What would this be? What is it when k is 1? It is just the variance, it is just the variance. What is it when k is 0? It is got to be 1, it is got to be 1, average value of 1. Now it is clear that the answer depends only on sigma because once you shift to mu, the only parameter left is sigma and the only quantity of dimensions sigma of dimensions length is sigma in the problem. So this got to be proportional to sigma to the power 2k just on pure dimensions <coughs> multiplied by some factor hmm? and that factor is not hard to find you can write down a Gaussian integral multiplied by any even power here and it turns out this thing is times. 2k minus 1 double factorial. This stands for 1 times this, this fellow here stands for 1 times into 3 into 5 into 2k minus 1. So this symbol double factorial is very often used for this or you could write it in terms of 2k factorial divided by k factorial times 2 to the k and so on and so forth. Now there is a nice interpretation of this combinatorial interpretation which were, which is useful in places like field theory when you do what is called Wick's theorem, it is very useful. Um, if you took this thing here x minus mu to the power 2k and wrote it out as factors, you have 2k factors each of which is x minus mu, then you can ask in how many distinct ways can I pair these fellows, can I write them pairwise, how many pairs you can, independent pairs can I find and the answer is precisely this. So this is really a combinatorial factor that arises from the number of ways in which you can pair 2k objects two at a time, okay. So that is what this is, now we could ask uh, what is, uh, so the very important property emerges that all the central moments are all dependent just powers of this guy here, nothing more, hmm, sigma squared to various powers. Now you can ask what is the cumulant generating function of this distribution and a very interesting fact emerges. K of u in this case is equal to, well first you want the moment generating function but remember this is just a uh, k of minus ik 
is just log of p tilde of uh, k and p tilde of k is the Fourier transform is integral minus infinity to infinity 1 over root 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared minus i k x. It is the Fourier transform of a Gaussian okay. and what is that going to be? It is also going to be a Gaussian, this guy is also a Gaussian and all you can all you need to do is to sh complete squares out here, pull out a 1 over 2 sigma squared complete squares here. Uh, it is also a Gaussian but what is the width of that Gaussian going to depend on? It is 1, it is it's sigma squared itself whereas here the width was sigma squared there it is 1 over sigma squared there is this uh, uh, very interesting property of Fourier transforms that the more compact a Fourier transform is the more spread out its uh, uh, function is um, the more spread out its Fourier transform is and vice versa. So the width here if it is sigma squared the width there is 1 over sigma squared very profound implications. So this will lead to the fact that k of u equal to mu times u plus half sigma squared u squared k of minus i k which is p tilde of k will turn out to be minus mu i k minus half sigma squared k squared. So what does that tell us about the Gaussian? It says of course it is immediately true that kappa 1 equal to mu and kappa 2 equal to sigma squared that is that is very clear. But what does it say about this? Yeah, greater than equal to 3. What does it say about it? It is 0 identically because remember it is the coefficient of u to the r over r factorial in a power series expansion about the origin of k of u and this is a polynomial that is it just the first two terms and everything else goes away. So an incredible property of the Gaussian is that all cumulants higher than the second one vanish identically. There is a first moment, there is a second moment and there is a, there's a variance, a mean and a variance and all the higher cumulants are identically 0. Okay. So a very, very basic property of the Gaussian is that the higher cumulants are all identically 0 which again means that if you look at the fourth cumulant for example or ask or the third cumulant that is identically 0, there is a physical meaning to these cumulants. The mean is of course going to tell you something about the average value, it is exactly the average value. The variance tells you the scatter about the mean. The third moment gives you what is called skewness, it is related to how asymmetric it is this distribution is and when you have a symmetric distribution like the Gaussian, the fourth or any other symmetric distribution then the fourth cumulant gives you information about how much it departs from Gaussianity because this relation immediately tells you this relation here it immediately implies that for the Gaussian kappa 4 is equal to this quantity which is uh, delta x that is the uh, x minus average x which I call mu, mu to the power 4 minus 3 times the average value of x minus mu whole squared squared is identically 0. Okay. For the Gaussian okay. and this quantity in general let me call x minus mu equal to the deviation from the mean then this quantity delta x 4 minus 3 times delta x squared the whole square and just to make it dimensionless we divide by this quantity delta x squared squared this quantity this is called the excess of kurtosis
and for a Gaussian it is identically 0. This quantity could be positive, negative or 0. If it is 0, for a Gaussian it is identically 0. But if it is positive, what does it sort of imply? It says that this guy is dominating over that in some sense and this is the fourth moment. So, it means that the higher larger values of x about the mean are actually more significant than the smaller values. It says something about the shape of this distribution. Hmm? Similarly, if it is negative, it says the large values do not dominate, the smaller values dominate. Right? So, in one case you got a thing which is fatter than the Gaussian, in the other case you got something that is leaner than a Gaussian and these are important indicators of the deviations from Gaussianity. And the reason the deviation becomes important is because Gaussianity is what I would expect if you had as we will see a lot of random variables added up in an incoherent sort of a fashion and the limit for suitable rescaling of this sum linear combination it turns out the distribution will be Gaussian under very, very robust conditions. So, this implies that whenever you have a deviation of this kind it says something very important about the underlying physics in the problem. Okay. So, keep that in mind that you have this is identically 0 for a Gaussian, but then there are distributions for which this is not so. Now, pretty much you can ask does this go on forever after all to define the distribution completely I need information about all the moments. So, is it that I need an infinite set of numbers? only then can I reconstruct the distribution. For instance, suppose I give you all the moments of a distribution, can you uniquely reconstruct the probability distribution function or the density function. This important problem is a problem in mathematical statistics, it is called the problem of moments and there are certain answers known to it under suitable conditions, it is a very important problem. We will not go into that, but let me explain say simply say that for practical purposes very often when you actually analyze data etcetera, the first four cumulants serve to pretty much describe the random process and the random variable <coughs> more or less completely. So, the mean gives you some crucial information about uh, what this variable is typically likely to be if it is a simple kind of distribution. The uh, variance gives you a scatter, the third one tells you about skewness or asymmetry and the fourth one tells you departures from Gaussianity. So, pretty much this uh, numerical purposes this should this suffices in most cases. But of course, from a theoretical point of view you need to know all the moments before you can make statements here. You could ask the following question which is an interesting one, I am not going to prove it here which is the following. Are there continuous random variables with well defined probability density functions such that just as a Gaussian had a quadratic cumulant generating function and all the higher cumulants were identically 0 after k 3 and onwards. Is it possible to have a cumulant generating function which is a polynomial of some finite degree greater than 2 and everything else all the higher powers are 0. So, the distribution would have cumulants up to some n and then every other cumulant is identically 0. Is it possible to have such a distribution? The answer is under fairly general conditions no. Either in principle all cumulants exist barring accidents in certain cases or the Gaussian says it stops at quadratic and that is it nothing more. There are other such properties which will also emerge as we will see when we talk about stable distributions we will see there are certain other interesting properties of this kind which will emerge that either it stops at the second order goes on forever then only other two possible possibilities we will see where this comes about. Okay. So, the next step now is to ask uh, I have some information about the Gaussian are there other such distributions there are several, but we will talk about it when we come to stable distributions. But first we would like to do the following I would like to take a set of simple ordinary very simple distributions for random variables add them all up and see where it goes what the distribution of the sum looks like. In particular, we will uh, undertake a simple exercise, we are going to take a whole n random variables all uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. So, this random variable each of the random variables takes values between 0 and 1 with a constant probability distribution function 1 and I add up all these fellows and ask what is the distribution of the sum of this thing. So, we will work that out explicitly here. Meanwhile, one final point 
if you have functions of random variables, their probability density functions can look very different from the distribution fun density functions for the original random variable. If you look at the Gaussian example, for instance, let us take a Gaussian with 0 mean. So, you have uh, p of x, this guy is 1 over root 2 pi sigma squared e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared, a Gaussian with 0 mean. For simplicity, let us set the mean to be equal to 0, right. And then I ask what is the density function, probability density function of a variable, uh, let us call it uh, xi, uh, which is equal to the square of this variable. And let us call it PDF uh, rho of xi. Now, it immediately it is obvious that this xi is an element of uh, 0 infinity. Unlike the original random variable which ran minus infinity to infinity, now you got 0 to infinity. Hmm? What is the distribution PDF of uh, xi going to be like? several ways of doing this. One of them is to say, all right, I do it by brute force. I do it by saying that uh, rho of xi must be equal to an integral minus infinity to infinity dx p of x and then a delta function which says xi minus x squared, x squared is xi. But to do this integral, I got to convert this delta function over xi to 1 over x, right. And what is the first property of uh, the delta function? It is a symmetric function. So, I can write this as x squared minus xi in this fashion. And I got a delta of x squared minus as constant squared, xi squared, uh, root of xi whole squared. So, I can write this as integral minus infinity to infinity dx p of x delta of x minus root xi plus delta of x plus root xi divided by 2 root xi. That is the Jacobian which the derivative and I do this integral. I can now do this integral because I use the delta function and plug it in. But you can also write the answer down. You see if I say that when x takes a value between x and x plus dx, capital X takes a value between little x and x plus dx, suppose xi takes a value between xi and xi plus d xi, right. Then rho of xi d xi must be equal to p of x dx. In this case, we are fortunate because as x increases, xi also increases. Otherwise, when you are talking about probabilities, you have to make sure that they are both positive on both sides. So, I can write this as these dx over d xi, but I must be careful to write that modulus sign. Okay. And I must express this thing in terms of xi because that is what a function of. So, I must write this as p of x is uh, square root of xi hmm? and d xi over dx is 1 over twice the square root of xi. There is no need for modulus because xi is not negative. Hmm? So, would that be a right answer? No, because minus x contributes exactly the same amount to this, right? So, there is a factor 2. What you put in here? Now, that is equal to e to the minus xi over 2 sigma squared over root 2 pi sigma squared xi. So, this 2 cancels that 2 and then you have of course, you got to check normalization. So, you got to verify that rho of xi d xi equal to 1 integrated from where to where? 0 to infinity. So, it is an exponential, but it is also got this factor sitting here. So, this distribution looks rather different from what the original 
variable was. For instance, if you wrote down in one dimensional motion, if you wrote down uh, the Maxwellian distribution of velocities for the velocity component, it is going to be e to the minus mv squared over 2 kt or something like that, the Gaussian. On the other hand, if you asked what is it for the energy which is half mv squared, then it is going to be proportional to e to the minus the energy with some kt factor divided by square root of the energy in the denominator. Hmm? So, this factor which came from the derivative, the Jacobian sitting there too, this factor here is crucial. What do you call this in that example which I just talked about in the energy? The density of states. You call it the density of states. It is precisely the density of states in one dimension for one dimensional motion. Okay. So, we will see where that is when we talk a little bit about the canonical ensemble, you will see that uh, this density of states plays a crucial role. Uh, we will talk about that when I uh, mention um, the characteristic function for this distribution. Okay. All right. So, the next exercise is to take a set of identical random variables and add them up and see if the how the Gaussian emerges magically. We will do that next time.